Hi, everyone. My name is Kirk Bachman, and welcome back to The Ultimate Dish. In today's episode, we're speaking with Dan Lyle, former professional rugby union player and one of the greatest athletes to play the game. Dan pioneered the game as the first American to play in Europe for the Bath Rugby team, where he helped the team win their first European Cup championship in 1998. Dan later played for the U.S. national team and was inducted into the U.S. Rugby Hall of Fame in 2016. Although he retired from the game in 2003, he has remained an executive leader and advocate for the sport. Join us today as we chat with Dan about life after rugby and his role in shaping the game today through executive leadership and mentoring. There he is. Welcome, Dan. How are hey, you, buddy? Hey, sir. Thanks for having me. This is a unique opportunity. It should be a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah. It already is. It already is. How how's uh, how are the ho- holiday plans coming together? Yeah, good. Uh, you know, we're not getting too much snow here in Colorado yet, uh, but um, I'm going to double down on that. And my parents live in San Antonio, Texas, which is a uh, a wonderful gastronomic experience if you've ne- never been there before. And, yeah, uh, yeah. So you guys are going down there? Yeah, we're going to go down there and my brother and my sister and my nieces and nephews. So I have a big, big group of people. So uh, it should be fun. They let you out for a while, huh? NBC Sports let you slip away for a couple of yeah, weeks? Yeah, I, I have to, the, in this virtual <laughs> world, I actually have to record a, uh, a game uh, from my parents' house. So I have to figure out how to transport a few things down there on the 20s. Oh, wow. Wow. Yeah. yeah. No, no rest for the wicked. There you no, go. No, so. I love it. I, I, I love following you on social media and all the, so, so let, let's talk about rugby for a minute here. I, obviously we've got a lot of uh, culinarians that follow us, but you know, I've had the good fortune of knowing you and your family for a long time. And, you know, when I think about you, I think about leadership, I think about coaching, and I think we have some really cool things to talk about, but more than anything, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make you blush for a minute because, I, I mean, anytime you Google you, <laughs> you know, you come up with something better. But this, this, this paragraph blew my mind. So, I quote: "Possibly the most significant rugby player to come out of the United States ever, and undoubtedly the best American player of the early professional era." Dan Lyle changed the game in a variety of ways that can still be seen today. Talk to me about what rugby means to you. Well, uh, I, like everyone else that's probably listened to this, at least those the Americans that are listening to it, you, you know, we we grow up playing soccer, basketball, football, baseball, lacrosse, all the all the wonderful sports that we have, and I'm, I'm missing out ten of them that uh, I played everything that known to known to us all, and and. Um, I, when I tripped into rugby, I was trying to make the Washington Football Club, the, the formerly the Redskins, out of college. And back then, there were no sports performance centers, right? There was no place to go train and <laughs> and, and do that stuff. So I, I, um, I had a first cousin, and it's, it's often blind luck, or you trip into some of these sports. And and I, uh, I started playing the game um, in Washington D.C. and um, and it really just felt like all of the sports that I had played rolled up into one. It was the athleticism of soccer and skill of basketball and the, the proprioceptive and physical contact of football, all those things. And so I really took to it um, probably as quickly as, as anybody has. And, and uh, I was just lo- really lucky to land in good environments, you know, first amateur level in America, then professionally abroad. And I had really good mentors in uh, at the U.S. national team level, and they all really brought me along uh, into a sport that um, that is the root of American football and, and basketball. It was here before those two sports were. So it, it, it's authentic, but it's unique all at the same time. I remember once, um, I, and, and I know your boys play, um, that it, it's it's more of a gentleman's sport though, right? That the tackling is more of a wrapping. Is that is that correct? Yeah, I mean the old saying of you know it's a, 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 a soccer is a is a gentleman sport played by hooligans and and rugby is a hooligan sport <laughs> played by gentlemen. That's a okay, you know. But in college we kind of double down on that in America, and and it's kind of like my 
my drinking team has a rugby problem, right? You know, yeah. uh, so, <laughs> so, you know, w- which is great in my business now in the event world, because, uh, you know, we are a consumption crowd. And so the, the F and B numbers, the per cap numbers are through the roof in, in, in stadiums that, that we go to, right? Um, so, yeah, but it is, it, it, the great thing, um, you know, my wife, who's English, I, I was lucky to meet over in England and, and bring her home and, and uh, back to America. Um, she's happy that our boys are playing rugby because they teach tackling, right? It, it's, it's actually, you have to physically put your head to a side. You actually physically have to wrap. And if you put your mind's eye onto football, you just collide, right? You, sure, you, you, yeah. you know, they're trying to take the head out of the tackle. Now they're trying to take all those parts and, and we got to embrace the hard parts of the game, right? The controversial side of it, right? Where you're trying to player welfare is, is, is the, is the highest level of, of, or highest priority for, for most organizations that are in sport, right? You want your kids and your, and your players to be safe. So, so rugby teaches the practicalities, the fundamentals of tackling, which begins to take the, the, some of the, uh, you know, some of the danger out of the game. So talk a little bit about the, I hope I get it right. The U S Eagles, that's the national team, right? Yeah. So, so, you know, as Americans, we follow, you know, the American sports complex is, you know, after school, scholastically, high school, college, pro, and or the Olympics. And we, we tend to forget outside of the Olympics that there's a bunch of international sports going on all over the world. And America is pretty good at some of them. And we participate in a lot of those. So just like the Major League Soccer or Christian Pulisic playing for Chelsea, he's got to come back and play for somebody, right? He's going to play sure, for the U.S. Yeah. soccer team. So the U.S. men's and women's national team are, their nickname is the Eagles. And so, yeah, so I had a decade career. I played 10 years for the, for the U S team while I was playing internationally club rugby uh, for Bath and uh, abroad. In in England. Can, can you, can you share a few of the fondest memories? I imagine the the cup, right? The European cup, 1998. How big was that for Bath in at, at that time, they had never won the cup before, right? Yeah, no, um, we were the first English team to win it. And um, Bath was a very, very, very good side when I came on it. They had won, you know, eight or nine English premiership titles, you know, league titles. And but the European Cup was uh, was, a, was a, a new mountain. And I, I came on into that team and we excelled. And, and the, the great thing about that, and I was – trying to think about stories that combine sports and food and fuel and <laughs> all those things together. We played the European cup final in Bordeaux in France against a team called Brive. Um, okay. They were next door. We stayed uh, for the three days building up to the event at the Chateau saint Emilion. Oh, wow. Is, which is <laughs> arguably one of the finest vineyards on the planet absolutely and so we we have this epic training and game and we're staying there in the chateau you know kind of out of bordeaux as you try to do we win this 1918 epic game in front of 40,000 people in the Stade Bourgeon and, and down and we go out and we mix the fans and we're all crazy and we have our suits on and our things and we come back at three o'clock in the morning and i kid you not michelin star chefs are cooking omelets for us right they're all they're (laughs) they're just as excited as we are they're popping bottles of wine that i I could not my my house is is less expensive it it was just a remarkable you know experience that you know and i love that that. what a great story i'd never heard that story before you did your homework i love well I love it. I love it. How, how big of a moment was that in your life? How, how did that impact decisions that you, that you made about your career, about your life afterwards? Yeah. I, I, you know, I don't think anybody needs a uh, pinnacle moments that be successful in life. You don't have to, to get to the top of the mountain, right? It, it, it's the challenge of getting there. The, the, the journey that is important, the, 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 the relationships that you build, but certainly from an American perspective, um, you know, uh, 
you, you know, having some of those crowning achievements and, and first um, allowed me to crack the door open a little bit wider for my career, for, for other Americans, for the next generation. So it, it, was, it was a pivotal moment, you know, um, for that. And the great thing about it was also is in, in a soccer mad country, a football mad in their uh, country in England, Bath is a rugby town. You know, the soccer team is maybe seventh or eighth division. And so it was it was so rewarding to come back to tens of thousands of people in the city square, you know, in a in a Georgian Roman city that was just, you know, that lives and breathes off of their rugby team and to bring be able to bring that back. So personally, it was satisfying and it was was satisfying to be part of something to to do for a town that is. that that where the recreation ground, which is the rugby ground, is in the heart of the city. It, it, it's it's the, at the foot of uh, so many of the different great uh, um, architecture there. So it was it was a great moment. And they'll never forget that. Ha, ha, have they won the championship since? No, no. I don't know if it's a curse or, <laughs> or, or not. But yeah, they haven't, and and they're not doing great this season. Uh, yeah. So it's not it's. Uh, it's not my, my other team. I played one season when I finished for Leicester Tigers. Uh, so one season, you know, I played seven seasons for Bath in my eight years over there in my career. And the Leicester Tigers are undefeated in the top of the league right now. So I'm claiming them right now. There you go. <laughs> there, I, I right think now. there's a movie in there somewhere. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I, I haven't really talked to you that much about this, but you, you grew up in, in a military family, right? Uh, yeah. I believe your dad's a general. And so, so I imagine you traveled around a little bit. Was rugby a part of any of that when you were living in Europe briefly? No, no. We lived in Germany for five years. Um, and when I was first through fifth grade, uh, I lived in 13 places before I was 18, including three different high schools and, you know, all over the place. So, um, you know, I, 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 um, What's the best way? I, I recently sat, uh, I was at a, a, the British American Business Council lunch in LA. Uh, and I sat next to Sebastian Coe, Lord Coe. Wow. Right now. <laughs> and this was just this week and, and sat next to him. He's, he was the double, he's won a couple gold medals and LA games in 84. He's the head of the track and field. He was a, all these kind of things. And we were, we were talking about, you know, what, the growth of rugby and the growth of the game looks like in America. And, and he said, look, don't act too American, but act American. Meaning they need that those that us that get the chance to get out and out of our own skin and out of our own country, we realize pretty quickly that everybody consumes the American culture, right? We export our culture, our TV, our music, our Everything about us, our politics, every everybody know, but we don't import a lot of stuff. Now we import a lot of cool stuff, but we don't import anywhere near the the pro rata of what's down there. So the coolest thing about being a military brat and traveling, you know, abroad is is you get to get you get to see America outside of America. You, you first and foremost appreciate it a lot, you know, yeah, and, yeah. and what we have. But second, you also realize that we, you know, we. We've got our, our our chinks in our armor, and and there are so many other wonderful things out there. And we're generally we're the collection of all of that. And I think if we realize that that we're the you know that we're the sum of our parts, you know, not individually, you know, uh, um, you know, you know, uh, superior or or practically superior in any in any shape or form, you know, then uh, we pretty quickly you know, get to a neutral ground and then you start enjoying, you know, everything about who you are and everything when you go abroad. Yeah. Yeah. Well said, well said. So, so at this point in your, in your career, you're spent, gosh, it feels like as much time off the field as you did on the field. And I think this pivot is, is really poignant. It's really important for our students to hear about too, because many of them, many of our students come to us in maybe like there's the second phase of their life, right? maybe second career. And um, after having been in a, in a previous career, when you retired from rugby and then you shifted uh, to leadership for rugby, director of operations for USA rugby, um, you know, what brought that about, Dan? I mean, a lot of times 
you know, superstar athletes love to get into the, the booth and, you know, share their knowledge every weekend. Others like to coach. Um, but boy, this is, you went right to the top, right? Like I'm going to have an impact on rugby in America for generations to come. Did somebody kind of guide you that way? Or is that something that you really thought about? Well, I think, I think, um, you know, in, in your last point, uh, I was raised by two wonderful human beings and, uh, and had a lot of uh, um, osmosis and, and, and leadership and, and kind of sucking in what my, what my dad and mom would say and do and see and, you know, look to the point of uh, every Thanksgiving and every Christmas, we would go eat with the troops and go to the mess hall and, and you know, and help, you know, spoon out those, you know, those, uh, those uh, ice cream scoopers of mashed potatoes and all those things. And, and really it's just kind of, uh, you know, chronic, trying to create a selfless, you know, thought process, you know. Um, so the leadership side of things and giving back was, I was lucky to have that ingrained as a, as a you know, as a, as an adolescent. And, and, and then I went to a military college and all that kind of stuff. So, I was always kind of in that place where, you know, maybe I was always in front of the class. I wasn't always the best, <laughs> you know, certainly, <laughs> certainly I, I had to be put in the front of the class a few times, uh, but, um, <laughs> but it, all of that stuff lends into when I was playing, I looked for extra stuff to do. And, and certainly I coached and I did community stuff and I did a lot of the stuff that you referenced before, but I also, uh, um, got stuck in with the players association and became an executive on that. And that's really about the business of sport. That's about collective bargaining, how everybody's going to work, work together, how player welfare and insurance and, you know, and, and, and salary caps and all those different things. And so I, I kind of knew I, I did some, I did some work on my, my MBA. I did some work on uh, what, life was like uh, in, in the economic world. I did some internships with GE Capital, you know, in England. So I was always kind of messing around. And I, I, I didn't know what, 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 where that was going to take me, whether that was going to take me to uh, finish graduate school, whether it was going to take me to a corporate finance job, whether that was going to take me to a teaching job. I didn't know, but I, I always knew that I wasn't going to be a coach. I always okay. knew that I was going to be in the business side of things. Now, as you know, I'm a coach, you know, yeah. <laughs> I, I coach my kids and your kids and all kids and, you know, and every, every sport. Cause I enjoy seeing kids and people, you know, have fun, try their best to be good teammate, all those things that we, they do. But I think the long and short of it is it's scary to retire at 33 years old from, or 34 years old at it from one profession and then try to reboot. And you, you, you're, you're not making the same salary by any stretch of the imagination. Right. You don't have all those built up tools and arsenal of, of experiences and all that kind of stuff. So you, you got to try to take what you learned before, be humble enough to kind of get stuck in, roll up your sleeves again. And then, you know, if you can, you know, if your trajectory is up, it's going to be up. If it's flat, it's going to be flat. And I always say to people, find time once a month to, to look outside of where you are, you know, don't. Don't just sure, look at yeah. your day to day to day. Try to look at outside of who you are. It's almost like your strategic reboot. Okay, what what strategically what am I doing right now? Not just my work, but my life, my kids, my wife, my you know my charity, whatever you, whatever is exciting to you. Yeah, it's healthy. It, it's healthy for the family as well. When when you think about your role as a as a as a thought leader a leader for rugby in the United States and in sports in the United States. Um, have there been some major achievements, some, some benchmarks that have occurred while you've been involved that, that you believe that maybe you had a little bit something to do with or a lot something to do with since you retired? Yeah. I mean, we've created events that uh, look like real American events, You're selling out stadiums, both, you know, major league soccer stadiums and NFL stadiums, getting prime time, you know, NBC foot, you know, uh, you know, on the big, on the peacock, you know, on the, on the main network, you know, um, you know, building a sport that, that America is so valuable to the Olympic movement because of 
uh, of the athletes we produce, of the, the money that NBC pays into, you know, the broadcast fees that, you know, getting into the Olympics or, or getting rugby back into the Olympics. Um, you know, I think that, uh, and now we're at the precipice, um, we're at our 1994 moment in American rugby where the, the world rugby, which is, which is the equivalent of FIFA and soccer, is, is knocking on the door saying, hey, we need to put a World Cup in America, right, for, for the game to be truly global. So we're working, you know, hand in glove with USA Rugby and others to, you know, what does that look like? And, and, and you know, that, that it's, you know, tentatively it's 2031, which, you know, I know 10 years sounds like a long way away, but. Um, oh, it gets here before it, you know it. Yeah. yeah you know, and, and so, um, but the, the, that the, the 10 year runway, you know, plus we have the 28 games in LA, which is, you know, they have men's and women's rugby and those, those games. So really the, uh, the unlocking of America comes with, you know, a couple of seminal, you know, you know, nobody in America is not going to watch the Olympics in, in America. Nobody in America is not going to watch a rugby world cup in America. Plus, as we've talked about before, the, the we, we every match is a home match in America because there's so many expats, right? There's, yeah, there's sure. more Brits yeah. and expats and Kenyans and, you know, it, 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 every country is represented, you know, in America. Plus there's a half a million people that travel in for that. So the, the, it, there's some really cool uh, moments and, and working for a company like AEG and, and, you know, the, not to continue on with this question, you know, we're arguably the largest sports entertainment company on the planet, right? And, you know, with music and facilities and sports and to be able to, to bring the AG uh, force to a sport and, and working with all of my colleagues and people within that level of sport, it, it's really just taken rugby from what is, was a niche uh, and kind of sport that, that you know, uh, you know, as, as Aretha Franklin says, you know, is, is, is looking for some respect, you know, um, <laughs> to, to the level of, of tr you can communicate, you know, on those same levels as other sports, you, you know, you got to earn your stripes, but you communicating that those are, those are some great moments and continued moments that, uh, you know, that we're, that we're currently in. So are we locked in then the United States 2031? That's well, what, we, we, they, they're they're awarding it uh they're so the next uh, world cup is in france in 23 okay uh, and and then they're awarding the next two world cups this may of, of 22 okay so um us in australia are the the preferred candidates but okay. we we've got we got to do a lot of financial work and other work to to uh to uh you know don't want to jinx it but uh, yeah it, it feels like <laughs> You know, as I said, the world game um, needs uh, the American market to oh, embrace sure. embrace rugby to the extent that it embraces you know a lot of international sports. When, when you and I were in college, and I won't say how many moons ago, but you know, <laughs> thank you, a few moons ago. <laughs> um, you know, our dads did not play soccer, right? Yeah, um, yeah. I yeah. I played soccer, and my kids play soccer. So we're the first generation of soccer dads, you know, Yeah, yeah. Um, that and those generational ties. And, and so right now, those 60s and 70s, meaning the 1960s, 1970s dads and 80s, when a lot of colleges rebooted themselves, there's almost, almost a thousand universities that play rugby, right? It's crazy, right? Because it was the root of American football, but they rebooted in the 60s and 70s. So a lot of those guys are maturing now and they've got kids, right? So we're kind of in that same, maybe 20 years ago that soccer was in where maybe the defensive line coach for the football team is not teaching, the, not, not coaching the rugby, the soccer team, right? <laughs> you know, so yeah. So where, where would we go um, if, if we get the night, uh, the 2031, what city would it be? Would it be LA? Would it be? So, so like, so like soccer World Cup, soccer World Cups in 2026 here, right? And we, we remember the 1994, it, it's about 12, 13 cities. Okay, so, so spread right, across. Nice. Yeah, you've got yeah. like 50, 48, 50 games, you know, so yeah. it, it's a lot, right? It, it's, it's over six to seven weeks, you know, um, and so it's a, it's a big, it, it's a big endeavor, you know, the, the, 
most of the major cities speak of themselves, New York, LA, San Francisco, you know, Houston, Chicago, yeah. but then, then you start kind of diving out. And, and so like FIFA was just here uh, a couple of weeks ago in Denver, and then they were in LA last week, you know, looking at those venues, making their final selection. So yeah, you kind of yeah. start with 25, 30, and you get down to your ones and that's about city hotels, transportation, all sure, the, sure, sure, all the logistics. Yeah. You know. Well, that would be exciting. We'll keep our fingers crossed. You know, I'm gonna, I, I, I'm gonna dig into some motivation here. Um, and and we're not really talking about, you know, food as much, but if you had to give a culinary student or culinary student some advice, knowing that they're in their their own kind of version of a training camp, right? They're trying to figure it out every day. They've got their own transportation challenges and family challenges, pandemic challenges. What what type of advice would you give um, to a student of culinary arts or any student for that matter to just to stay focused and and and, and to really dig in and, and and achieve their goals? That's a great question. Um, I, you know, and they're rarely in sport. And rarely in business is there somebody that has it all, right? You know, the you know, in, in baseball, that you know, the you know, the the the, the multi-tool player, you know, that that can you know can do all things, you know. So you know, what you once you understand the basics and understand the game or understand your craft, which is you know, in the in the in this is in the culinary environment, then you probably are going to start figuring out what you're really good at, right? Mm -hmm. And 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 where that is going to lead you, and, and you know, um, and not try to be all things to all people all the time, right? And what what am I good at? What do I? The basics are you have to have the basics, you know, and and then but then from and you have to keep practicing the basics right no 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 matter who you are right whether it's free throws whether it's basic passes whether it's you know just the you have to you have to keep practicing the basics you have to do that and then you find out where you are and then and then ultimately it's kind of a balance between being an individual and being a team member right you know you find sure. your you find your ability to to what you're really good at how you fit into the team and then and then how and how the team operates around you and so I think business, sport, and I would imagine, look, you know, if you're, if you're on a, some of those, if you're, if you're the chef at the Cheesecake Factory, God bless you, who knows, you know, what? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like a thousand different, you know, items, you know, like, yeah, yeah, I don't know what to do, right, but, uh, you know, you know, in, in today's world, if you're really good at a few, a few things, then stick with them, right, and then just add something to your repertoire all the time, you know, I'm speaking as a novice to uh, to what what goes on in your world, but um, you know there are some fundamentals to life, and, and you know being you know being reasonably good at a few things uh, versus average at a lot of things um, could be a differentiator. Yeah, but you, you, I think you nailed it too. I mean, we 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 focus on the basics, right? You gotta you, you gotta crawl before you can walk, and uh, the fundamental skills before we can get to the next level. You know, we have a culinary Olympics as well every four years in uh, in Germany, and 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 the level of of competition is is unbelievable. And I know your boys are getting older as as mine is. Um, are there one or two key principles that, like, whether you're coaching them in rugby, or 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 with their homework? Are there a, a few key principles that that have really stuck with you from, from growing up with your, with your father and your mother, you know, traveling around the world, where there are a couple of things that just really stuck with you that are absolutely non-negotiable? Well, you know, we kind of have this thing where um, we, we start with trying to have them do the simple things. We call them the basics, right? So yeah, that they can, yeah. they can accomplish some stuff in the, in the beginning of the day. That, that's literally making their bed brushing their teeth, <laughs> combing their hair, you know, picking up their, picking up their, their, uh, you know, after themselves and, 
you know, and just doing some of that stuff. And, and those and are then, tough tasks. Can I just say? <laughs> those they're, are they're tough, tough tasks. They're, they're tough, but you know, the, <laughs> it, it, you know, th those things. And then, and then, you know, of course I, I I'm a, you know, I live in the sports world and all those things. So, you know, everybody can be captain cliche, you know, and, and figure out another <laughs> saying, or and you can find all kinds of things. And there's some guys and some coaches that have wonderful, you know, uh, multi-tiered uh, structures and, and, and their vocabulary is what, uh, and, and the way that they use uh, the, the discipline that, that they, um, that they've, they've brought onto themselves into the, into their environment is there, is interesting. But I, I start with, um, you know, have fun, you know, you know, you, you can't, Perfect. you gotta have fun yeah. in life. You know, and, and the second thing is you got to try your best, you know, and, you know, that, that, that is on the basketball court. That is, uh, that is math homework, you know, that is, you know, everything. And then the last one is, is be a good teammate, you know, and being a good teammate on a team is, you know, you know, is, is give a pass, get a pass, right. Don't, you know, all those things, you know, you know, put, put, smack a, uh, somebody on the, on the back, on their back you know, to encourage them and all that kind of stuff. But it's the same thing in school, right? Being a good teammate is looking after each other and, you know, and calling somebody out if they're a bully and, and you know, all of those things. We try, try to align as many things, but it's it's not overcomplicated. So there's 15 rules that they have to follow. And, and you know, and and the fundamentals, right, of, of math and reading and things like that, just like, you know, passing and catching or dribbling and shooting, you know, I try, if the, if you understand the fundamentals and you understand and, and you have a, a good work rate and, and you're, and you listen, but here's the second part of listening. And I'll finish with this. The second, the other part of listening is that you're also heard, you know, that, yeah, that yeah. But because coaches have to say, Hey, do you understand what I'm saying? You know, but not in a negative, negative way, you know, Hey, does anybody else want to say anything? If, you know, have I got this right? You know, do you, because sometimes a student or, or, uh, or a colleague or somebody is sitting there and nodding their head and they just don't want to tell you that they, they, I don't get what you're saying, but I don't want to raise my hand. Right. And so, you know, you got to be self-aware you know, to some degree, right? Yeah, yeah you got to be yeah. humble enough to reverse engineer the conversation sometimes. Yeah, yeah, no, great, great advice. Um, here, here's a tough one, right? Your legacy is unprecedented, right? It, it's, it's, it's there. Um, you know, based on some of the comments you just made, being a good teammate, is there is there one, is there one key principle that you want to be remembered for? Yeah, geez, that is a tough, tough question. Are you a doctor? Are you a doctor as well? <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, clinical yeah. psychologist. Yeah. You're, you're ready to go. We're good. We're going to uh, go deep today, buddy. Yeah. We're going to go deep. Um, <laughs> no, you know, um, you know, the, you know, the definition of leadership is, you know, making in my definition, you know, the, you know I'm stealing this and cliff noting it from other things is, you know, making those around you better, right? You know, um, love that, love that. Yeah. So, so trying, just trying to, um, if people encounter me, you know, I can be tough at times, right? I can, you know, I can be direct, you know, um, and I can talk to you versus or at you sometimes, you know, because <laughs> you know we all get frustrated, we all get, you know, we all you know, have time crunches, we all have to get get things over the line, and, and you know you have experiences that that others don't have and so you need to get those out but I, I i think you you want people to um realize that hey this person never pigeonholed me always gave me an opportunity you know yeah. always listened yeah. to me you know um and, and i i define culture as setting good expectations you know meaning kurt knows what i expect of him he knows what I expect of myself. He knows what I expect of the team around him. And we all agree to that, you mm -hmm. know, and, and then we go and then that, that our culture is set. We, you know, we, we now know what we're all going to do. And, and then we manage go, those and expectations. Gonna, right, and we're going to yeah. go out and execute, yeah. right? Yeah. You know? Yeah. So, yeah. No, I like that a lot. I like that a lot. And um, 
Yeah, um, I'll be billing you for our for our session uh, at a later time. <laughs> hey, we're getting close to uh, uh, to to the end of our session. Great, great chat. The name of the podcast is the Ultimate Dish. So, um, dig into your to your kitchen there, Dan. And what is in your mind the ultimate dish? Is it Becky cooking? Is it you cooking? I am extremely lucky that uh, my <laughs> wife is um, more than capable. Um, and, and I come, but, but um, you know, we had to cook growing up. My mom and dad, and dad worked, you know, so there was a level of uh, understanding the kitchen and, and yeah, understanding yeah. that. And, and I quickly in, in life um, started to figure out when I was in my late, in my middle teens and late teens and high school and college that, 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 that food is fuel, you know, uh, and that it's, it serves a purpose. Uh, I believe now that, that food is, is also, you know, um, I, you know, I, I'm not going to be controversial and say it's medicine, right. But it, it, it's what we put in ourselves, you know, it, it, um, is, is a product of how we feel and how we look and a lot of the things, you know, um, eating right and balance and have a balanced diet with the, with the right culinary taste factors is always, is always, you know, the, the balance. Um, so I, I appreciate, you know, the, 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 that food is, um, and, and also, um, that, uh, that food is not always available, right. You know, that, that is that for a lot of people. And so you gotta, you gotta cherish that you have the ability to, we're fortunate. Uh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so I, I, you know, we, we have a farm table in our, in our dining room. You know, we, we, we like to have family di uh, dinners, you know, we like to uh, a couple times a week and Sunday, you know, uh, you know, we, we take turns doing a roast and, and, and God forbid that every British person uh, knows <laughs> what a roast is, but, but we have 19 different vegetables and, and, you know, and, and copious amounts of cheese sauce and gravy and, all the different, you know, special parts of it and crumbles, you know, and so my, I, I have a, a, a expanded voc vocabulary that's Anglo American, European, and so forth. And I, I grew up in Germany, and so I yeah. harken back to the goulash days and and, and absolutely and, 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 and all <laughs> of the, uh, you know, all of those things. That's one of the things we do at my parents' house in, in San Antonio. We have a German night. You know, oh, that's all, great! Yeah, we all do that, and I know that your your heritage is is thick and fast in there, but um, absolutely. Absolutely. I, I, I would say that I, I, I love it when family and friends can get around a table. Um, and whether it's a, a Sunday roast, whether it's a couple different pots of curry, you know, um, oh, for sure. or whether it's, yeah. Yeah, or whether it's a takeout, um, you know, or, you know, on my specialty, I, I usually do the breakfasts, you know, and omelets and waffles and pancakes and like a lot of dads do. Yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> uh, I just cherish those moments, and uh, um, you know that we can uh, we can have that time. And and, and generally, it, it, when you cook, you feel you it, it, it strips away um, kind of what I'm doing on the day because it's it's just serious enough to you have to concentrate, but not serious enough to where you have to uh, you know you know you're 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 tuned in to, uh, and, and you can't enjoy the company around you. Oh, it's where the best conversation happens. That's that's where we hear with what the kids, you know, had going on in school and yeah. you know what we're doing on the weekend. Yeah, great, 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 great response. And thanks so much for joining us. We we know how busy you are. Um, are you heading anywhere before you go down to San Antonio or kind of lucky I, I just got back from L A for a few days there. And okay. um, and uh so um you know, I'm gonna uh you know, take uh, the second half of next week off and the and the following week and enjoy and uh and good for you around running in january good. so you know hopefully you know we're um you know i, I want to make sure that everyone you know we're thankful for all of those that are protecting and serving and serving in the you know in all the different places that are the hard parts of our life and and uh that we can you know, mount this, this bloody virus and, and, uh, you know, and get back to, you know, public consumption at, at its finest. Absolutely. Thanks again, Dan. Really appreciate it. My best to Becky and, and I hope you guys have a beautiful holiday. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Enjoy. 
Absolutely. Thank you for listening to the Ultimate Dish Podcast brought to you by Auguste Escoffier School of Culinary Arts. Visit escoffier.edu forward slash podcast, where you'll find any materials mentioned during the podcast, including notes, links, and other resources. You can also browse other episodes and subscribe.